So I'm going to hand off to you. Thank you, Eric. Can you hear me okay up the back there and understand my Australian accent, what's left of it? Uh, so yeah, I'm not going to do a sing and dance uh, act. I'm not going to sing for you. That would be torture. Uh, but I thought, given that we only have a certain amount of time on this planet, it would be a shame to waste a few minutes of it. Uh, uh, so yeah, th th though I have plenty of questions. Actually, I'm going to ask you some questions and uh, we'll see if after, after I give my talk, your answers will be any different. Uh, so what, one of the, the questions that I like to think about for myself, but I'm also, also curious how people besides uh, myself and my family think, um, is how long would you live if you were given a choice? Okay, so, uh, and you get very different answers, by the way, and there's no correct answer. Uh, and it, it doesn't, it's not that the scientists say I want to live forever and it's, it's not religious people who say I want to die at, at 60 or 80. Uh, it's it really, it's very personal. Um, you don't have to put your hand up, but we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you if you do want to answer, and I hope you all do. Um, and you can only vote once uh, to raise your hands. Uh, so who among you would want to live to 80? Okay, let me ask it differently. How many of you would want to only live to 80? To die at 80, yeah? If any of you here are 80, I apologize for the question. <laughs> uh, yep, yeah, 80. Okay, how about 100? Die at 100. Okay, a few more. What if you could choose to die at 120? Okay. Healthy, okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Are we healthy or not? Okay. So that, and then I guess, so let's do two more ages. Who would want to live to 150 if they could? Okay. See the spread, it's, humans are so different from each other. All right, uh, I'll, I'll get to the healthy part in a minute. This, this was part of what's stirring the brain cells for you. Okay, finally, who would, if they could, live forever? That's quite a lot of you. Those of you who are enjoying life, I guess. Uh, extreme. So this is, the, this is the, the real thing to think about. If, if you could be as healthy as you were in your 20s or 30s, would you want to die? Period. No. Okay, so let me ask that question again. If you could stay as fit and healthy as you were in your 20s, but still retain all your memories and wisdom, would you want to live forever? Hands up. Financially secure. Well, you still probably have to do some work. <laughs> You're not going to retire. But you could start a new career at, at uh, 50, 60, 80. Why not? There would be nothing against that. Uh, think about where we were 100 years ago when we would worry that our children would die from a splinter, an infection, or, or a cold. And, and now look at us, we, we do not expect to die from an infection. We expect to die from things like cancer and Alzheimer's disease and heart disease and diabetes. But that, the time when those diseases don't occur until much, much later, until you're in your hundreds, uh, is coming. And, and when that happens, we will look back at today with as much pity as we do the people from 100 years ago. Right? And it's all just a change of attitude. Think about this. Um, who among you thinks of aging as something different than regular diseases? Yeah? Aging is not, not a disease. Okay, how many of you think aging is a disease? About half-half. That's a good mix. All right. We can work with that. All right. Let, let's do a, a, just a mind experiment, an imagination uh, exercise. If, if we all move to Australia, that's a good choice, Australia. But what you didn't know, that it's a well-kept secret, I can tell you now, that in Australia, we, we actually live to 150. We do. We, you see those tennis players? They're actually 105. <laughs> okay? We're so fit, we do so much exercise. If we'd only avoid the sun, we could live even longer. It's the, the beard. I see this beer up there. 
all right, so in Australia, we live to 150, and you have just decided you want to go live in Australia. Why not? Um, maybe you don't like the politics here, you want to go and live in Australia for a while. Whatever you want to do, you go there, and you land, and you're at the immigration, they say, you're 70? But you've got grey hair. What, what's going on? Oh, no, that's where I come from. 70 is elderly. Oh, really? That's really sad. Um, and then you, you start to move into your community, and uh, you become frail at 80, uh, or frailer, and you can no longer play tennis, and by 90, you're, you're really in a wheelchair. What would happen if that was the case? Think about it. I think that Australians would try to raise money for you to try and figure out what's wrong with you, try to cure your syndrome. A doctor in Australia would name her or his, himself after this particular disease that you have. Point being, it's all about context. We call aging something different than disease, than disease because it's so common. Okay? And just because something's common doesn't mean that it's not a disease. It actually means that it, it's a very important disease. It's just one that we all eventually will suffer from. If you go to the Merck Manual of Geriatrics, okay, so this is the, the gold standard book for, for doctors to learn about geriatrics. They, they have a definition of disease and they have a definition of aging. And let me tell you what the definitions are because it's very interesting. A disease is a decline in function, usually over time, that happens to less than half the population. If it happens to more than half, we call it aging. And that's, to me, not acceptable. That doesn't mean that we should put billions of dollars into studying single diseases, but ignore the one disease that we are all suffering from that increases your risk for disease thousands of, of times more than other things you do in your life. Okay, so you know what, if you're a smoker and you, you increase your risk for lung cancer, it goes up about five-fold. Do you know how much aging increases your risk of lung cancer? It's about 10,000-fold, okay? And we just accept that. Okay? We, should be, we should be studying and putting a lot of money into understanding why this occurs over time and try to combat it. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Eric. Thank you. That was a wonderful pre-introduction. So, uh, as, as uh, you were just hearing, we have uh, David Sinclair with us today. He is here uh, to uh, deliver the Kinter Lecture. Well, William Kinter was a, a PhD uh, investigator, became a, became a summer investigator at MDI Biological Laboratory in 1963. He left the position as professor of physiology at State University of New York to become a full-time investigator at the Biolab in 1971. The high quality of his research, his keen intellect, and his ability to attract young scientists contributed to making him a valuable colleague and member of the MDI Biolab community. Uh, Kinter's interests ranged from uh, hemodynamics of the kidney to the effects of pollutants on renal transport systems. He first worked with kidney during his graduate training at Harvard University with Dr. John, uh, John Pappenheimer. Kinter pioneered autoradiographic studies using kidney uh, frozen sections and gradually turned his attention to transport mechanisms of organic compounds across renal, renal tubules. In 1970, he and his students studied the effect of DDT on osmoregulatory mechanisms in the flounder. His interest in the effect of toxic compounds in the environment led to landmark papers on the effect of pesticides on eggshell thinning in birds. Studies of the basic physiological effects of environmental pollutants, including crude oil on the molecular and cellular level, occupied him primarily un, un, up until the, his untimely death. Kinter's own contributions, as well as those of his colleagues, were instrumental in shaping this branch of research at the biological lab. So, David Sinclair. Uh, he is a professor at the Department of Genetics and co-director of the Paul Glenn Center for Biology of Aging at Harvard Medical School. He is very no well known for his work in understanding why we age and how to slow its effects. He obtained his PhD in molecular genetics at the University of New South Wales in 1995. He did his postdoctoral work with Lenny Garenti at MIT, where he co-discovered a cause of aging in yeast as well as the role of a, a gene encoding a protein called SIR2, uh, and it's how it affects changes in DNA architecture 
that have major consequences for the activity of genes intended to keep cells and tissues healthy. In 1999, he was recruited to Harvard Medical School where his lab's research has focused on understanding the role of sirtuins in disease and aging with phenomena that are of great interest in the process of aging, including chromatin, energy metabolism, mitochondria, learning and memory, neurodegeneration, and cancer. Uh, he has contributed uh, to the understanding of how sirtuins are affected by molecules made inside of our own cells, as well as compounds derived from food, for example, resveratrol. Uh, Dr. Sinclair is a co-founder of several biotech companies, including uh, Sertris, Ovis Science, Genosha, Cobar, Metro Biotech, Arc Bio, Liberty, and Liberty Biosecurity. Uh, and is on the boards of several others. His latest company, Life Biosciences, is the major sponsor for the comparative aging course that's happening now on campus and is training the next generation of leaders in uh, investigating the intersection of environment and genetics as they influence aging. He is also co-founder and co-chief of the uh, and editor uh, of the journal Aging. His work is fe featured in five books, two documentary movies, 60 Minutes, Morgan Freeman's Through the Wormhole, and other media. He is an inventor on 35 patents and has received more than 25 awards and honors, including the, uh, I don't have time to read them all, but I'll name a few of them, the American Association for Aging Research Fellowship, the Nathan Schock Award from the NIH, the Ellison Medical Foundation Junior and Senior Scholar Awards, Merck Prize Bioinnovator Award, Australian Medical Research Medal, Frontiers in Aging and Regeneration Award, Top 100 Australian Innovators, and Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people in the world. Uh, <clears throat> uh, busy guy, and, and uh, recently, recently was knighted in Australia. So, yes, with that, I will turn things over to David. Thank you very much, Eric, for that kind introduction. How's the, uh, how's this microphone going? Yeah, I've got one stapled to me up here, but... No, we'll do this? Okay, gosh, I feel like Phil Donahue. <laughs> Very good. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. Um, it's great to be here, and uh, thank you to the, the people who have made this lectureship possible um, through donations and, and grants. Uh, so I want to tell you today a, a bit of a story, uh, a bit about my story uh, that can ser serve as a story for all families, and the story of humanity and where I think we're going, and also throw in a little bit of science in between. So, uh, the university makes me disclose that I'm involved in, in companies, um, but if, if I do talk about a company, I will, of course, uh, mention that, and uh, um, that's part of the, the full disclosure. All right, so importantly, what I want to tell you about today is uh, going to require you to, I wouldn't say suspend disbelief, but, but try to think differently than the way you've been thinking about things for pretty much your whole life, since you were age five or six. Okay, when you're five or six, uh, I'm pretty sure we're all the same, psychologists have determined this, that we realize that our parents and our grandparents are not going to be there with us forever. And then we realize by the age of six and seven that everything that's living, including the trees, our pets, and even ourselves, will one day die. And that is a really scary thought. It takes really a lot of courage to think about losing your loved ones. It takes even more courage to think about the loss of your own life. And so what happens is when we're about age seven is we we, we, we forget about it. Uh, I actually think that we've evolved to think to, to forget about it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have done very well as a species if we were all just running around with our heads cut off, worried about our, our impending death. Um, but as we get older, you know, I, I've lost a parent. You, you have to deal with this. But for most of our lives we, and, and daily activities, we don't think about it. Um, unless you work for me, and then you always think about it every day. <laughs> We work hard to, to solve this problem that we think is the greatest unsolved of human problems. 
Uh, and so what I'm trying to do with my life is to not just do little bits of medical research and publish papers in these journals, uh, but to unite humanity in a new Manhattan project for good. And we can talk later. I'm going to aim to leave some time for questions, because certain questions I'm sure will come up. How do we pay for this? Will there be too many people? What's going to happen um, to the planet? And I have some thoughts and answers to all of those questions. But before we get to the social aspects, let's talk a little bit of science. So there have been times in human history where really strange and unexpected things have happened. And right up until they happen, most people think they're impossible. Because if you, we, only, we tend to predict the future by looking backwards. And that's what we've done. And suddenly, we've got a computer in our pockets that we can talk to anybody in the world on. Where did that happen? Has that happened? So the same thing was happening in 1903 uh, at a place called Kitty Hawk. And this is, the, the, this is the Wright brothers who were using real science, real engineering equations to figure out how to power human flight. But if you ask anybody back in New York, uh, is this going to happen? Everyone would have said, They've been trying for the last thousand years. This is, this is crazy stuff. This will never happen. But the moment they did it, the moment that photo was taken, it was pretty obvious where humanity was going. Once it's done, it seems fairly obvious. And from that moment on, you can already start to imagine flights over the Atlantic, the Concorde, and even a journey to the moon. So these events do happen, and we are right in the midst of an equivalent one for humanity right now, even though most people throughout the world and even in New York don't, un don't realize yet what is happening. And that's what I want to tell you about today. And I want to argue that of all the exciting things that you'll read about in the media, the iPhone, the electric cars, um, which I love, the robots, the biggest thing that's going to happen this century is the change in our ability to control biology. It's happening so fast now that even I, as a, someone who grew up with this technology every day, uh, my head's spinning off. I, I really cannot believe the things that I pick up magazines and read, scientific magazines. Just things that two years ago were, were considered, if not impossible, far future um, technologies. I'll give you an example. So the human genome is often used, and it, it's really w worth considering driven in part by advances in technology in silicon chips and computing power, but also in our understanding of how to read the DNA code. When I was a graduate student in the 1990s, it took me three months to read one gene in a yeast cell. And I basically, I got my PhD for doing that. And it involved toxic chemicals, thin sheets of glass, radiation. It was not fun. Um, actually, it was fun, but it wasn't safe. And uh, what happened after that, this is now 1994, 95, the human genome started to get underway, this human genome project. Instead of uh, taking three months to read one gene, they started to read a thousand genes in a day. And they actually got to the point where the human genome uh, was going to be able to be done for under $2 billion from a united team around the globe in giant buildings, mostly at the NIH. Uh, and we, we learned in the year, I think it was 2000, that the human genome had been completed, even though it was only about 30% complete, but they didn't worry about the other stuff. Uh, but it was hailed as the um, remarkable human achievement. Okay, so today, what can we do? At least in the lab, fairly routinely, I can take a DNA sequencer that I could plug into my USB port in my computer, and I could read my genome overnight for a few hundred dollars. Okay, that's where we're at. And soon, it'll be so cheap to do a genome, it's not even worth paying for it, it'll be $10 that will be the services that come with it. And who knows where we'll be in 30 years. I mean, already I could take the air vent out of these, room, these rooms here, or this room, and, and tell you who's been here for the last six months, and also what pathogens are out there and how to treat them. And one of the, one of the companies that's on that list is actually doing that, not from air vents, but from every person with a runny nose uh, or a blood test, and seeing what is actually in the bloodstream, rather than waiting for 19th century technology to grow up the bugs, and often bugs don't grow. But uh, I digress. The point is science is going unbelievably fast, and things like uh, being able to control the body are no longer unbelievable. We can actually control uh, a mammal, a mouse, 
and actually a human, despite, um, in the absence of regulations, um, what we can do with them is now as easy as what we used to do with little yeast cells. Uh, as a PhD student, I used to change the genetic structure of a yeast cell overnight. We can now, if you come to my lab, I can show you, we can inject a mouse with genes and turn them on and edit them and delete them as easy as we do with a yeast cell. And that's only happened in the last few years. So let me tell you about where I think we're going and, uh, and what, we, what this will look like. This is um, the lifespan of my grandmother, who passed away about five years ago now. And she led a very normal life. You can see she uh, was very active, actually. She was born in Hungary, escaped uh, in 1956. She came to Australia because it was the furthest from Europe she could get, and uh, ended up uh, raising me from a lot of my childhood with my mother. And through this, this period, she, she got kicked off Bondi Beach for wearing a bikini. Um, she went and lived in New Guinea for a few years by herself um, up in the Highlands. Very active woman. The point being, by the time she reached her late 70s, early 80s, uh, she was not doing well at all. Um, and she was no longer herself. Uh, and she had lost her love of life. She didn't listen to music anymore. She lost her sense of humor. And really, the, the last five years, you wouldn't wish this on your worst enemy. She barely remembered why she was in a nursing home. Uh, let alone uh, what, what's the point of living. Uh, so she passed away, uh, thankfully, fairly quietly one day. But the point that I want to make with this slide is that right now we spend a lot of our days in a decrepit state. Uh, and, and instead of, well, due to medicine these days where we just target one disease at a time, we can keep the heart very healthy but the, the mind still ages. That is a nightmare scenario. You end up with someone like my grandmother who, whose heart is functioning fairly well, but her brain is gone. And so this way of dividing up diseases one by one, and in the last 100 years, we've gone from 122 causes of death to 14,000 different causes of death, aging not being one of them. What you end up with is a, a long period of chronic disability and, and disease. And that is something that we need to fix because that's what the 20th century gave us. We're living longer, but we're not living that much better. In fact, in some countries like Britain, the, av the percent of the people are spending in their lives in a sick state is increasing, not decreasing. So what do we have to do? Well, I'm gonna argue tonight that there is a better way to address this. And we also have the technology. So what we wanna do, what we wanna do is, instead of having this sick period at the end of life and the decline, what we want to do is to actually push out this healthy phase of life and then die relatively, hopefully painlessly, but certainly quickly and be less of a burden on society. Now, I'll just drop in a bit of, um, excuse the, the corporate stuff here, this is a corporate slide, but this is what we do in my lab as well. And if you do this, it's been calculated that it will save about $10 trillion a year globally, um, a, a few trillion dollars here just in the US in healthcare costs. Because people here who are healthy are still productive members of society, even if they're not you know, making a lot of money, they're still doing nonprofit work, they're volunteering, they're helping families, they're helping kids, they're keeping themselves and their houses clean. This is really a world that will look back at this world and say, I'm glad I didn't live back in those early 2000s and the, whatever the decade is we call this one. All right. Uh, so just a little, just my personal story to give an example. Uh, this was the year 2000. Both my parents were still uh, healthy, happy, and alive. Uh, my mother uh, did not survive. She contracted lung cancer in 1995. Uh, survived on one lung for 20 years, which is the Australian world record. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, she, she couldn't go on any longer with just one lung. It became fibrotic. Um, so I saw what happens to someone who leads a, a normal life. She, she lived until her 70s, but uh, that is, as, as um, Eric said earlier, uh, passing away, in my view, far too early. Um, I'm actually of the view that passing away at all is, is too early, but uh, my father, I wanna use his, him as an example. So he went on a, a regime of some of the molecules that we've been inventing over the last 20 years, uh, 15 years. And sometimes people say, 
David, you can't use your father as an experiment. And to that I say, why not? No. I, I actually, no, what, no, what, the truth is that he, he volunteers to do this. He says, David, I've seen what's going on in your lab. He's an ex-biochemist. And he says, I'd like to try it because I know what's going to happen if I don't try something. And the risk is really low. He's taking natural molecules. These are not toxic drugs or anything yet. Um, so he's been trying for 10 years resveratrol, uh, no, 15. And then um, he's on a new one that I'll talk about today. And he's also on a diabetes drug, which is fairly common, called metformin, which I would say about a third of the people in my field, professors, are taking metformin. It's one of those little secrets that the world doesn't know yet. But we, our field really thinks that metformin and these other molecules are good. Now, I'm not a, a true doctor. I'm just a PhD. So I, I don't recommend anything. Um, but I, I will share with you some of the science and the stories, and you can be the judge. Uh, I gave this talk uh, actually last week to a group of 20-year-old students at Harvard. And they asked me, oh, David, can you please talk a little bit about your career? So I'm going to do that, not because of ego, but because they really like the talk, and I, I thought that I would share it with you as well. Um, so I went to MIT to work with Lenny Garenti in 1995, as Eric mentioned. And this is now 1997 in the New York Times. What we discovered is that yeast cells have a particular cause of aging. Their DNA becomes, uh, is broken, and the cell tries to repair it. And in repairing it, they lose their identity. They lose their ability to reproduce, uh, and then they become sterile, big, fat, and old, and slow, and then they die. And that was the paper. And these uh, RDNA circles were a consequence of that genetic instability. And this led to a, a whole new, in part led to a whole new field about the regulation of the genome and the, the trade-off between controlling genes, keeping them on and off at the right time, and repairing genes. And it turns out these proteins that we work on called the sirtuins, and there are seven of these proteins in our body, they have a dual role. Most of the time they're telling our cells and ourselves which genes to turn on at the right time so that your nerves in your brain know that they're nerves and your liver cells know that they're liver cells. But they have a different role as well. During a, what I would call a genetic emergency where your chromosome breaks, and our chromosomes are breaking in every cell a few times a day, which means there's a few trillion per day in your body. These proteins, they leave the genes that they were controlling, and they move to the break temporarily, and then they move back again. And what I'm going to tell you today is I think that that ancient genetic survival circuit is still in our bodies today. And it's very important for our bodies to repair DNA and slow down reproduction and cell division while we're repairing our system. So it's very important for us to survive and not get cancer. But what I'm also going to tell you today is I believe that is the reason we age. That's that the same reason that our bodies have evolved to repair DNA and respond is actually the main reason that leads to all the other causes of aging. Okay. So I'll, I'll tell you about a bit of evidence of that. Um, so I moved to Harvard in 1999. Uh, I was 29. I didn't know what I was doing at all. Um, but I was very lucky to quickly fill my lab with some wonderful students who shared the vision about make, having a big impact on the planet if we can actually change uh, medicine. So in those days, it was crazy to work on aging. I was only one of a few people. There were some pioneers in the field that had recently mutated worms and flies and made them live longer. Um, but we didn't really know what was going on. But what we now realize is that this old view of aging was completely wrong. And still today, if you go to parties or bars and talk to people about aging, they'll still say, oh, I drink POM Wonderful, I take antioxidants. That's actually not really going to help you much. This old view of just wearing out is really missing the most important point about aging. Our bodies are not just like cars. We don't just wear out. What's actually going on, we've discovered, is that we have these repair people that take care of us. And these, in, some of these are called sirtuins, these proteins I've been telling you about. There are others. There are over a dozen of these really important proteins that are known in the body. And what they have evolved to do, the reason they exist in our bodies and throughout life, bacteria, 
in worms and plants is that they sense whether we're in a harsh environment, maybe there's not enough food, maybe we've had to just run for five miles to catch up with the clan, and they say, okay, we don't have enough nutrients and the environment's tough, we need to hunker down, slow down reproduction, in, in fact, maybe even stop fertility for a while and just focus on building a stronger body so that we can survive until times get better. And that's what we've learned to harness to be able to slow down aging in life. And you might say, well, slow down aging, that sounds pretty crazy. Reversing aging, that's science fiction, right? No, in fact, in my field, these days, if you reverse aging in a mouse, it's barely even a headline anymore. We do this all the time. It's now common to find another molecule that extends a mouse's lifespan by 20%. That's not even a big deal. But now the big question is, how do we translate this and move this into humans? And that's what I'll tell you about at the end. So let me just get back to this why do we age question. Um, so the, the field over the last 20 years has come up with eight or nine main causes of aging. I think if, if any of you have been reading magazines or newspapers, you'll have heard of some of them. The loss of telomeres, the ends of the chromosomes. The loss of mitochondria, the power packs of cells. Um, misfolded proteins, such as in Alzheimer's disease, the cause of, one of the causes of Alzheimer's. Now there's a list of eight or nine of those. And our field, interestingly, has put down a flag and said, yes, we figured this out, we understand aging. There's nine causes. Eureka, nothing much else to do. That's a load of baloney. Uh, we don't know what drives those things. We don't know what causes those things. What's going on at, on at the nanoscale to cause those things to happen? And this is what I think is going on, okay? It's not a proven hypothesis, but we're getting a lot of uh, positive evidence, and the field is, is coming around to this idea. The idea is that our cells, when we're born or when we're very, very young, we have all the right genes turned on at the right time. Uh, so genes that are on are in red, and genes that are off are shut down by these, in part by these sirtuin proteins. They, they generally switch genes off. So off and on. So this, this could be a, a nerve cell. It could go on to be, this could be a, an early skin cell. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a type of cell. And over time, what we think happens is that these genes come on when they shouldn't, and genes that used to be on become switched off. So your nerve cells are no longer, as you get old, behaving like a true nerve cell, and your liver cells more like a neuron. And we actually see that. If we take apart a mouse's brain, um, RIP, the, we can put the mouse's brain through a cell sorter and, take, and measure the genes that are turned on and off in each one of those cells of the brain, in different parts of the brain. We can do that for the liver, we can do that for the kidney. Can, nowadays, you can do it for anything. What we're discovering is that as we get older, those cells in our brain or in the mouse's brain are losing their identity and they're becoming more, more of a mush rather than very specific delineated cell types. Um, so let me just tell you in a little bit of a couple of slides about how the cell actually does this. How does the cell tell which genes to be on and which genes to be off at the right time? Well, that's the chromosome. I think if any of you have studied biology, you know that what they look like, but what they're composed of are these uh, wrapped up balls of string around proteins called histones, which then fold into these other structures. Um, this is called chromatin. And basically, if, if the chromatin is all compacted like this, very tightly, uh, we call that heterochromatin, so genes are switched off. And if it's opened up, this is euchromatin, this is active. So these might be nerve genes that make us a nerve cell and these might be the liver cells that need to be switched off in the brain, okay? And we now understand a lot more about this. We think these are big loops of different genes, and there are proteins. There's even a, a wedding ring type of protein that pinches this off and spools it out when it's needed. Um, so we're getting a very good picture now, and we can even take cells now and look at them in four dimensions. We can see how these loops change over time. It's a really interesting time to be a biologist. But what we see during aging is the following, that these loops, um, and these compact regions, they change over time. And we think it's because the proteins that control these structures here, so there are other proteins that come in and stick here, they actually get distracted by one of these, a broken chromosome, and probably other types of DNA damage. But this is the worst type of DNA damage you can have. 
Because if you divide with a broken chromosome, you're toast or you become a tumor. Uh, so you do not want to divide when these are broken. And we think that these are a main driver of gene dysregulation and that gene dysregulation is the reason all those nine things happen over time, okay? Um, including the loss of the ends of those chromosomes. And we actually found that was true in yeast cells. When I was at MIT, all those years ago, we discovered that if you create a DNA break, the proteins that are here, these proteins, will move, they'll go to the break, they'll help repair, and that these genes become dysregulated. And that that is a driver of yeast aging. And I think the same thing happens in our bodies too. So what does that mean? First of all, it means that you should avoid x-rays if you can. Uh, you may even want to avoid those x-rays or those scanners at the airport. They're, they're pretty low radiation. But avoid radiation, avoid DNA breaks. It's very hard to avoid them totally because they're happening all the time. They happen when your cells replicate. Uh, there's a cosmic, cosmic rays coming from above and there's radiation coming from below. Um, and another way to look at this is the following. Uh, in the late 1800s, there was a guy called Waddington who came up with this concept of the uh, epigenetic landscape. And what he meant by that was that a cell that starts out early on in embryogenesis can become anything. We know that. If we take a stem cell out of my lab and put it into a mouse embryo, it will become part of that mouse. But what he, he cleverly realized, even before we had a lot of um, molecular biology, was actually any, was that the, these cells go down into what we think of as valleys that determine the fate of that cell, and this is called differentiation. And what's going on at the molecular level is the following. We've got uh, these loops of DNA that turn on, and that might be cell type A, let's call that the nerve cell. And if it falls in this other valley, you get this other loop and these other genes turn on, and that's cell type B, that may be a liver cell. And what we're finding in our lab is that during aging, with excessive amounts of DNA damage, these loops become dysregulated over time and the cells change shape. By that analogy, it's as though when those marbles hit the bottom of the valley, you're nice and fit and young in your 20s, but over time, you start to shake it up a bit and those marbles will start to drift over into other valleys. So what is the secret of immortality now that I've told you that? Well, obviously, it's to figure out how to get those marbles to go back into those valleys where they came from and the cells to start acting the way they did when they were 20. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today, how I think that can be done. But before I do that, I want to show you how we can drive things in a, in a forward direction. How do, how do we actually test that this hypothesis might be true? So one way is to create these DNA breaks in a very precise way and not cause mutations, because mutations would just make things complicated, they, the mice could die from cancer. So we mixed, we, we took a gene from a slime mold, something you know, that would grow on, on, a, on a log, and we took a gene out that is known to cut the mouse genome in just a few places, and it cuts it in a way that doesn't create mutations or cancer, and we put it into these mice, and we could turn that, that gene on anytime we wanted in the mouse's lifespan. And we chose to do it when it was young, to try to accelerate the, the shaking of that landscape. And if we're right, what we should see is that those mice will go through aging, albeit a little bit faster than usual, because we're going to accelerate that. So when we treat these mice, they're age four months of age, and then when we look at them later, they're uh, 18 months of age. Okay? When we're treating them, they don't notice. There's, they're not sick, they don't feel it. It's like getting an x-ray, we don't feel that either. But look at what happens after their treatment. These mice have now, these are litter mates, they're the same age. The genomes are identical. We've, we've done the genomes of these mice, we've read them all. But this is epigenetically aged. This is havoc of the Waddington landscape. We call it epigenomic noise. That's, our, that's our, uh, the way we talk about it. So that's good evidence that this might be right. Uh, we've looked at these mice for the last eight years. Uh, we still haven't published them yet because it just gets more interesting every time we want to do something. We're, we're just right, as I drove up here today, we were writing the manuscript. So hopefully it'll come out in the, in the media sometime or in, in the publications. 
But what I can tell you today is that these mice are very similar to normal aging, just faster. They've got arthritis, they get dementia, they get cataracts, they get skin aging. The stem cells in the body that normally age, these stem cells age faster. They get senescent cells, which are these zombie-like cells that accumulate every aspect. We've given these mice to probably a dozen labs now, each specializing either in kidney or eyes or brain. Uh, and they come back and they say, wow, we've never seen a mouse that looks so much like human aging. So what's interesting is maybe we've, we've created a mouse that actually can experience 80 years of life instead of just two and a half. And we're excited because a lot of the diseases that we study in mice, like Alzheimer's disease, are using mice that are only a year or two old. And no wonder we're not making much progress in these diseases because a mouse doesn't behave like it's been around on the planet for 80, 80 years. These do. So we're now studying Alzheimer's and a variety of human diseases in these mice. But the real exciting experiment is how do you get the mice back to being young again? And so the analogy here, um, fortunately, I don't need to tell you all what this is. But when I, I spoke to the 20-year-olds last week, I said, we used to put music on this thing. Oh, really? Why would you do that? Uh, so what we think, we think is going on with aging is you're getting a scratch CD. So what, what that's really interesting, so anyone who's into information technology, um, I think that aging is a, is a loss of information. That's all it is. You know, I think um, second law of thermodynamics. But it's not the genome. We, you know, thanks to the 1950s and a lot of physicists getting into biology, not that there's anything wrong with that, but they biased the field and said, it's the mutations that cause aging. We don't think that's true because there are a lot of mutations that don't accelerate aging, and there are also a lot of mice that, that can get a lot of mutations. You can mutate the mice, and they don't get old. And there's a lot of, a lot of other data, but generally the field doesn't, doesn't think mutations are the only driver or the main driver of aging. If it was true that mutations are causing aging, by the way, you couldn't sequentially clone animals like we do routinely these days. Um, and the rumors about Dolly the sheep aging prematurely are not true. And if you ask Barbara Streisand about her dogs, I'm sure she'd tell you they're doing fine. Uh, uh, point being here is that um, if, there was a, if there was a loss of information in aging, we couldn't clone animals. So the genome is the, is the digital information. So we've moved to digital because it's long lasting. Right? It's very hard to lose digital information. Uh, there's an analog system on top of that. That's the reader of the, of the CD. And in our cells, those are the readers of the genes, the packaging of the genes. So what changes over time, I think, is not the digital information, not the genome, but the epigenome, the structure of how the DNA is read. So if that's true, it's good news because mutations are pretty hard to reverse, but turning on and turning off genes is not that hard to reverse. You just need to know how to tell the cell to do it. So aging could be much more reversible than we first thought. It's the equivalent of getting a polish and, uh, and getting back the ability to read all the DNA. Think of it this way. If you're over 50 or 60, maybe you're 70, all the information to be young is still in your body. Your cells just have forgotten how to read it. Interesting concept, huh? And I think that's true. I think that our bodies can be young again. We just need to teach them. So I'll go a little quicker now because we're running out of time, but there is calorie restriction, which is a good way to, to stay young, we think. In, in some animals, it works. We think that there are genes that underlie this effect. These, this is one of the sirtuin genes that we discovered in yeast. In our bodies, it protects all of the cells in the body, uh, and it responds to diet and exercise. So one of the things we've been excited about is making molecules that can stimulate these defensive pathways and tricking the body into being in an in an environment that's, that's um, adverse. And one of the molecules that turns on the sirtuins is called NAD. NAD is a chemical in our bodies. We need it to survive. Without it, we are dead in 30 seconds. And as we get older, by about age 50, we have about half the levels we had when we were 20. So what we've been doing is testing, if we bring NAD levels back up in old mice, what happens? Maybe it rejuvenates. And the experiment I'm just going to tell you about that we published earlier this year uh, was to ask the question, can we delay or even reverse frailty? And one of the main problems for us as we get older is the loss of blood flow. It's very underappreciated. But as you get older, 
uh, myself included, you feel more tired, you don't get enough blood flow, you can't get rid of toxins. And one of the main reasons is that the capillaries or capillaries in the muscle and organs start to decline in number and in size. And no one has figured out a way to safely restore those. And without good blood flow, you lose your memory, you lose your strength, you end up in this terrible cycle of not moving, and then if you don't move, you don't have your longevity gene switched on, and it just gets worse, and then you go into this bad cycle. So what if we could get people out of bed, feeling young again, and exercising again? Well, here's the molecule that we used. It's called NMN. It's a precursor to NAD. So if you give this to mice or you give it to your father, they will make more NAD. Those are crystals of, of NMN that we are using in clinical trials right now at Harvard to see if what I'm about to show you is true in humans. But it's definitely true in mice. What we see, forgive the mouse, black mouse on a black background, but one of these mice has been on NMN and one of them has not for a week. These are both old mice. They're equivalent of about a 70-year-old human. And after a week, you can see there's a big difference. They can run um, between one and a half and three times further than they could before but when we treat them with this molecule. It's a very safe molecule as far as we could tell. It's a, it's a natural molecule. Um, and one of the companies that uh, I am involved with on the board of is running this clinical trial to see if we can give it to people and A, is it safe, and B, will it give them more energy and blood flow? So we've finished phase one, it, it's safe apparently, and we're moving into phase two uh, in the next few months. So just in the last few minutes, this was a, a slide for the students last week, but I, I kept it in because I thought you might be interested in the kind of activity that is around this field. So a lot of these companies that I'm involved with are actually going after aging. There's a huge amount of activity in the field. There's at least a dozen that I could rattle off that now are taking this approach to disease very seriously. Not only that, there's a wave of activity at the federal, federal level in many different countries to consider aging as a treatable condition. The moment that happens, the world will change because now doctors can prescribe medicines for just about anybody, let's say over a certain age, whether it's 50 or 60, and then the money will really go into this research. But right now, the amount of money that goes into the study of the basic biology of aging, considering that it affects 90% of us, how much do you think it is? Total. It's, it's, it's a fraction of 1%. It's, it's barely anything. We who are in the field, we struggle to keep our labs, labs running. Um, oh, this is, this is just one of the company's fairly complicated thing to get up and running. We have operations throughout the world. Um, and this is the, the company that uh, Eric mentioned is helping to sponsor the, the talk. This is not a promo, it's more just to talk about um, some of the interesting things that is go are going on in this world and why I think that it's going to happen sooner than later. So it's called Life Biosciences. It's based in Boston. It's found, it's got offices throughout the world, in Sydney, in uh, Singapore, um, three offices in, in, um, in the US, uh, one in Barcelona, and labs as well. And what we're building is a Manhattan project, a privately funded Manhattan project. We have uh, some private equity, we have some venture capital. And what we're building, uh, with, I don't know how many of you have met David over there, David Setbarn, he's helping to, to do this part of it, which is fund young scientists and labs and brilliant minds throughout the world to do breakthrough science in aging, come up with new ideas, intellectual property. We can help them start little companies that hopefully are successful. We invest, they have drugs. The world realizes this is doable and it's a virtuous cycle. Uh, so the website says, aging is not a fact of life. And then finally, uh, I just wanted to mention that I'm writing a book. Uh, I was working on it a little bit on the way up here. This is my co-author, Matt. I've teamed up with him and one of the best illustrators in uh, this country, uh, Katie Delphi. And we've just submitted it. And it, these are some of the beautiful illustrations. I hope you can see we've got medical future. We've got the molecules that increase lifespan in mice. It's essentially explaining everything that I've always wanted to get off my chest, some of which you can tell I'm 
I'm already doing with you. So let's just, in the last few minutes, go back to my father. I mentioned that he's been on three different molecules um, for up to 10 years or more. Uh, so he just turned 79 um, in September. Yeah, he's turning 79 in September. Uh, so what about him? Well, he retired at 67 and was thinking, I've got about five to 10 years of good life, and then I don't know what's gonna happen, but I'm lo not looking forward to it. So now he's almost 80, uh, and he's actually feeling better than he did when he retired, he says, by his own admission. He just flew back to Australia last night. Uh, he was in the US for nine weeks helping us with our kids and he's going back to work when he gets home in Sydney. I said, you have to come out for the ceremony in uh, 1st of October where I'm getting my knighthood presented. And, he's, and my wife says, you cannot ask your 80-year-old father to fly out to America again, such a long way. And I said, Dad, Sandra and, and, and a doctor friend of mine says, I can't ask you to come out. And he says, yeah, I'm not sure I can make it. I'll have to check my schedule. So, <laughs> uh, so he's, this is just ex exhibit A. It's, it's not a clinical trial, we're not gonna publish this, but it, hopefully this is an example of what life will be like in the future for millions of people. He's enjoying life again. Uh, he's cl climbed tall mountains, whitewater rafting. Uh, this was just a few months of his life. It's like this pretty much constantly. He climbed Tasmania's tallest mountain last year with my ex-girlfriend. Um, I'm okay with it, but my wife is weird about it. I don't understand. And then, um, it's all right, she's, she's not that young anymore. Um, okay, and finally, we have a future where my son, who's now 10, um, can look forward to a life where, you know, maybe we can only make it another five years of healthy life, but his generation, the sky's the limit. You can, you can really see where, where anything's possible, and we're just taking off with the right, right flyer. We're off the ground, we're building, building it as we go, but we know we can get off the ground. We know that this is working. And so I, I wanna end by saying, um, I, I hope that this is going to work out. I think that even if I'm not successful, there are many people who are doing this now. Pharmaceutical companies, governments, the FDA is on, on top of this, and it's going to happen. The only question is when? Whether or not we are the last generation of humans to live a normal lifespan, or the first to benefit from these new innovations. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks to everybody who contributed to this. I've noticed, especially in young children, let's say, uh, in a day camp. Children six, seven, eight, nine have this tremendous energy. They don't walk. They literally do not walk. They run. And they run and they don't even get out of breath. You can watch children running for 15 minutes and they just go back and forth. And then something happens. Yeah. I don't know if it's in the environment or their parents or something that begins to slow them down. So then after a while, they're no longer running. They're walking. Yeah. And maybe a lot of them are sitting. Right. So uh, I don't know how relevant that is, but something is occurring. And I've noticed that, that there are these children who are so dynamic mm -hmm. uh, that I wonder, how come? What happens? Why, why all of a sudden are they slowing down when they had all this infinite energy, it seemed like? Yeah. So I don't know if it fits into any of this. But that's my feeling. Yeah. Uh, you, well, you're absolutely right that, that little kids can't sit down. Um, I've had three of them. They're absolutely amazing to watch. Uh, we don't study children um, in my lab, so I'm, I'm certainly not the, the expert. If there are any pediatricians here, please put your hand up. But, but I, I'll try to say something meaningful, that, that young animals that we study have high levels of chemical energy. It, they're bursting with chemical energy, and that goes down over time. Chemical energy is called ATP in, in the body. And uh, so the two big ones are NAD and ATP. Those are the two molecules for life. They're as old as life itself. And young 
animals, probably young kids, are full of these two life-giving molecules, and they steadily go down over time. And it's not just that we lack the chemicals, it's that when those chemicals go down, the defensive genes that I've been talking about, these vitality genes, you could call them, they're sensing the levels of these molecules. And when those molecules go down, they don't work as hard anymore. And so we become susceptible to diseases. So think of it this way. One of the main reasons we get diseases as we get older, um, it's not aging, per se. It's not time. It's that our body's innate defenses against diseases lose their will. And, they, and we have a way, to, as I showed you, to kick them back into life. And maybe we can stay young. Why not be, be a, a kid forever? That would be uh, a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, do you know the reason, or is there a reason why uh, these chemicals are more because they're just like going down? Yeah, so why, why do the chemicals go down over time? There are a few reasons. Um, but the simple answer, unfortunately, is we don't fully understand why. That's an area of active investigation in my field. Now, one answer is that there's an enzyme that degrades the NAD molecule, and it seems to come on in some tissues in the mouse. So maybe our bodies are just are doing something very stupid, which is destroying the molecule they need for life. Why that happens, we don't know. Um, another thing that happens is that the, the mitochondria become less active, so that the, the ability to make this, these molecules is declining as well. If, if, if I'm right, the ultimate upstream stream reason is that the, ge the genes that control these processes are uh, being switched, switched off and on at the wrong times as we get older. Um, and what, we, what we're finding is that if we can reset the epigenome, they start to make those chemicals again and not degrade them. Um, oh, I, I'm going to take a quick question, but 10 seconds to answer something that I forgot to mention or introduce. We think we understand now the, a way to reset the epigenome, to get to polish the CD. There are four genes that are used by scientists to create stem cells. So if I took one of your skin cells, I could grow it, I could turn it into a stem cell, pluripotent stem cell, turn it into an egg. I could even make a sperm from that same culture, and I could fertilize it and make a, a human. I'm not going to do that, but we could do that with a mouse pretty easily. Those genes that allow that to happen, they're called the Yamanaka factors. We're using those factors now in an animal to make them young again. And we've found the right, we think of the right safe combination of those rejuvenating factors. And we've given them to mice now, old mice, and even mice that we've crushed the, the retina, sorry, the, um, what's it called? The optic nerve. And those mice are regrowing their optic nerves. So we have a right flyer, but I, I think, I've just seen glimpses of a Concorde down the, down the line. How does uh, that molecule your dad's taking in NMM compare to nicotinamide riboside? Okay, so um, NMN and NR are very similar molecules. The only difference is a phosphate. Uh, in the lab, they work very similarly in the mice. They both increase endurance and they'll both uh, improve metabolism. And we're, I haven't published this yet, but they both extend the lifespan of mice. Uh, as for the finer differences, we find that NR, the one that you can buy on the internet, is less stable. So if you buy it on the internet, keep it in the fridge, I would recommend. Um, other than that, I think that they're both really interesting molecules. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's go here, and then we'll come back up there. Uh, yeah, try that. I'll, I'll just speak up. Oh, no. It's easier. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you mentioned uh, radiation as one of those things that we should avoid, and w one of the things that I always ponder are all of the man-made things that have accelerated aging and disease. So what would be some other things? For, two questions here is what is, how many of these things are man-made mm -hmm. inflictions, and then how many of these things can we prevent knowing, I mean, ju you just think about the unpreventable, for example, yeah. the airport situation, and how many of these things that we are predictable that we yeah. could take control of and eliminate right. from our life? Yeah, uh, Yeah. so that, that, that's a really tough one because we're surrounded by chemicals, and we don't know how many of those are accelerating aging. There are certainly chemicals that are in the environment, in, in our food supply, that do accelerate DNA breakage and could be accelerating aging. 
and we don't know it. I mean, the theory that I just proposed to you tonight, there are only a handful of scientists in the world that work on this, so there's a lot of work to do. The good news is that we don't have a lot of evidence or strong belief that the reason we're aging is largely driven by the, the environment. X-rays are an ex a, a, a severe example. I, I, I don't worry day to day about chemicals. I try to avoid them, but it is what it is. What's important to know, though, is it's far more important to keep your defenses up against those chemicals and against just the ravages of, of biology. And so that means do your exercise, don't um, overeat, be a little bit hungry um, every other day. Those are all good things that'll keep your NAD levels high and your um, defensive genes active as long as possible until we can figure out additional ways to boost them even further. Um, but I wouldn't want you to worry, based on my knowledge, that um, there are chemicals that are causing this. Um, even the X-ray, uh, sorry, the uh, the scanner, that was a bit of a bit of a joke. Um, I, I try to avoid them just because it's not worth taking the risk. And I've been told that it's about the same amount of radiation as you get on the flight. And I don't understand why you double your dose. Um, but the the scanners used to be much worse. They've, they're now millimeter wave, I've looked into this. And I would like to do an experiment with a scanner and a mouse, but they're fairly expensive machines. Um, but yeah, TSA Pre is a good way to avoid them if you're concerned. Uh, right, up the back. Have you given any thought to the social consequences of this? If you live to 150, what happens to work, retirement, marriage, even the sense of self and personal identity? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we could talk for another hour about the social effects of this and um, with the Protestant ethic, is life worth living if you live too long? Would you say till death do us part if you were going to live to 150? <laughs> I don't know about you, sir, but I would love an extra 50 years with my wife. Um, but uh, your point's well taken. You have to think of your life very differently. My father is. I remember in his late 60s, he thought it was pretty much over for him and now he's looking forward, he's acting at least with a mindset of living another 20, 30 years. It may not, probably won't happen, but his optimism, he's never been happier in his whole life. And that's just a wonderful thing to see. Uh, socially, yeah, I think that uh, particularly uh, women it will impact. Uh, younger women who are working and can't have children until often in their 30s and now 40s, that will change in a good way for them. We're able to use the same molecule that I showed you here, the NMN2, to uh, delay and actually reverse infertility in old mice. And so one of the companies that's uh, at LifeBio is working on a pill that a woman could take to increase her egg production or even bring back her egg production. And there, there are some crazy anecdotes just between friends of women who are uh, experiencing um, their cycle all over again. But those are just anecdotes. But the, the point there is, this is going to be a big impact on the world um, if and when this happens. Uh, the good news is that it's not going to happen overnight. We're all not just going to suddenly live forever. It's going to take a long time, and it's going to be gradual, the same way scientific research has progressed over the last 200 years. It's going to be an extension of that. But the good news is we're not going to plateau. There are some pessimistic scientists who say, oh, we've reached the limit of our lifespan. There is no law that says that we have to die at 100 or 120. There's nothing like that. And anyone who says there is a limit really doesn't know what they're talking about. Uh, we'll, we'll share it. Yeah? Oh, right. You too. Both of you. No, I was just curious, the study that your dad is in. Yeah. I don't know how many other people are in it, but are, is everybody else faring as well as he is? So my dad isn't in a formal study. He's just volunteering to, to try it. But the studies at Harvard, uh, so that, that's been 25 people so far, and it's a safety study, so all we know is that nothing bad happened. And then we'll know later in this year if something good happens. So we'll, we'll see, yeah. It, it's really exciting times, though. Yeah, my question is a follow-up to that. And you said your father was taking three drugs. Did you uh, deluded to metformin was one of them, but what's the other two? Uh, the resveratrol from red wine, that's an old story um, that we came up with. 
that's, um, so you can get resveratrol on, on the internet as well. Again, I'm not recommending anything. Please don't, don't, don't uh, blame anything on me. But I, I'll tell you what, what my family does. That's all I can tell you um, legally. The <laughs> and I'm on camera too, so watch out. The, so my father and I, we take a, a gram of resveratrol every morning with yogurt, uh, which is a high dose, but it's very safe. There's nothing that has ever been seen to be a problem with that. It's a cheap molecule. You can buy it on the internet. Um, just buy very, whenever you buy something off the internet, um, be careful. Some of it doesn't have any compound in it. Um, it's really hard. I, one of the things I'm going to put in my book is what's real and what isn't. And I'm sure there'll be lawsuits, but I'm tired of people putting my name on products that I have nothing to do with. Um, you will find my name all over the internet. So resveratrol gram, um, buy the purest stuff if you want to try. Um, metformin, uh, 800 milligrams, that's a mid-range dose for a diabetic or a pre-diabetic. Uh, you can't get it without a prescription in this country. If, you're, if you go through Bangkok, you can just buy it at the pharmacy, like I do. Um, but yeah, th there are a lot of doctors who are waking up or getting educated in the benefits of, potential benefits of metformin beyond diabetes. There was a study, a very convincing study, that looked at 10,000 people who started taking metformin and those that didn't. And uh, I think it was 5,000 per group. And the 5,000 that didn't take metformin, um, their risk of cancer, Alzheimer's, um, and frailty went up over time. And those that are on metformin actually went down on average. That convinced me to try it. So you, know, you, you can look that up on PubMed um, for yourself. And then the third molecule is NMN. And he takes 500 to 750 milligrams in the morning as well. Um, and that's like, a, that, it's about as, it's similar to a vitamin B3. NAD is a vitamin B3 relative. So the, the point is, uh, A, that it, it's now socially acceptable to talk about this. It's not crazy stuff anymore. There's a lot of science behind it. I'm not, um, you know, one of those people who's trying to sell you anything. And there's hundreds of papers now that say that these three molecules are beneficial in animals and safe in humans. Um, and the other thing that's, that's really interesting about the time we live in is 10 years ago, my colleagues would have rolled their eyes at a conversation like this, but it's becoming socially acceptable. And there are even conferences on this topic about which are the best molecules and very serious talks with this government and the FDA about having a drug available to the American public that could be um, prescribed to... Uh, to ward off the effects of aging. Um, he went up first, and now come back. Yes, there is a rare condition where some children develop premature aging, progeria, and I wondered if any of your studies have had an opportunity mm -hmm. to look at those children and whether or not they have any of the changes you've seen in those mice that you... So there are a few diseases uh, called, collectively called progeria, progerias, and the one that you typically see uh, in the media is the most severe one called Hutchinson-Guilford syndrome, and those children die in their teens, and it's, it's, it's tragic. There's another one where uh, people can live into their 40s and 50s called Werner syndrome, and there's some others. What's interesting is that there are, so, first of all, the scientific viewpoint is those diseases are caused by disruptions to the, the organization of DNA, which fits precisely with this hypothesis. But for the, for the, to your question, which is, does the research put, uh, affect those patients? Well, possibly. So resveratrol, which is a chemical activator of that CERT1 enzyme that I showed you, that CERT2 uh, Brian Kennedy at the Buck Institute fed mice that were engineered to have progeria and they did a lot better and they lived longer, I, I, I recall. And so it, it could be that these technologies could really benefit those children as well. And I increase, I'm increasingly thinking that it's truly premature aging, just an acceleration of what naturally happens to our cells, which is the disruption of the, the epigenome, as we call it. I'm gonna have trouble phrasing this, but how much of this uh, 
research on molecules in the aging body can be directed on the individual organisms that go bad, that get damaged, like the kidney, mm -hmm. or in my case, the lungs, or the heart, or, uh, yeah. well, you get the, exactly. the body is aging slowly or well, but then there is this gap. Mm -hmm. uh, very good question. So part of our drug development programs um, in, in my companies and in others is to deliver the molecules where they're needed most. And so a few quick answers. One is so that NMN is just the beginning of many different molecules. We've had a group of chemists out in Western Massachusetts been working for five years to make hundreds of different varieties of NMN. Some are targeted to the muscle, some to the heart, some to the brain. So we can use chemistry to, to do that. There's also nanotechnology where you can inhale uh, molecules that will just get into the lung and treat the lung only. Um, same for the brain, same for skin. And uh, so that's actually an area of great interest because if, if you want to avoid toxicity, you want to get it to just where it's needed and nowhere else. Though consi consider this, this is not a typical group of medicines because it might treat your lung disease or your Alzheimer's or prevent cancer. Or, but as a side effect, what we think is gonna happen is you'll be protected against all the other diseases as well. So would you really want it to only hit one of your organs or would you want it throughout the body to not just pr protect one organ, but protect all of them at once. So we're working on all those different aspects, some throughout the body with a pill or an injection, or some that are just local delivery, even in the eye we think can be possible or inhaled. Mm -hmm. Folks, we're gonna take a couple more questions, and then we're going to thank David, and then he's gonna hang around uh, for a reception if you have additional questions. But some people do have to leave, we don't wanna make them feel rude by standing up in the middle. So two more questions. Right. Persistent. <laughs> um, so if you do have a problem with one lung, like my grandmother has a problem with her lungs, and you were to take these, this NMN molecule, how, hmm, how long do you think, or is there a way to tell how long it would uh, help the lung or heart I guess, repair or get better, function better? Is, yeah. is uh, do you mean how long would it take to work or how long would it yeah. last? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. We haven't done any human studies. But I can tell you in the mice, they, the mice only take a week to start growing new blood vessels and get better blood flow. It's very quick, actually. So it might be something in the order of weeks to, to see a potential difference. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm at Harvard, I'm, I'm not going to say, yeah, this is going to cure everything. We don't know. Um, does it seem to be safe so far? Yeah, right. Um, but I was, I was surprised how quickly the molecule worked in the old mice to regrow those blood vessels. Now, there is a downside to growing blood vessels everywhere. If you have an, a fast-growing tumor in your body, you don't want extra blood vessels there. Um, so what we did was we gave our NMN molecule to mice that had tumors and it didn't accelerate those tumors, and it certainly doesn't give old mice tumors because they live longer. Um, but I wanted to put that out there because that's always a risk if you grow blood vessels, that there is a potential downside as well. Yeah, I have maybe a, a geeky technical question, and that's, you mentioned the three, NMN, resveratrol, metformin. You also had on your slides rapamycin, and people I know that are self-experimenting won't want to touch it because it would reduce their immune system activity. But what the question I'm asking you is, are these all independent in the sense that they work on different pathways? So when you take combinations, you're getting an increased effect as opposed to both of them working the same pathway, so it does no improvement. Yeah. All right, you've touched upon the most important question in the field today, besides does this work in humans? And that is, how, where do you tweak these pathways to get the best effect? And we've traditionally, through mostly because of lack of money, research dollars, we've treated or changed one pathway at a time, one molecule, one genetic mutation, one transgenic mouse. Because making combinations, it quickly becomes $5 million to run an experiment. But there's new technologies 
that allow us to introduce three genes at once, or three drugs with genes. And what we're finding is that the combination is better than taking them singly. Um, a combination of, of rapamycin and metformin work very well in mice, better than the singles. Um, we are now doing, adding extra sirtuin genes to the mouse with viruses and giving NMN, and the combination is really dramatic. We were able to extend the lifespan of very old mice. And what, what you are hitting upon is, we used to say, oh, one, one pathway extends lifespan, and then my pathway is better than your pathway because it extends lifespan. All right, we would fight at conferences. 10 years ago, it was a field you didn't want to work in. It was horrible. People would fight. But now we've, we've mellowed a little, and we, what we say is that your pathway is talking to my pathway and vice versa, but my pathway is better than yours. Um, <laughs> but then it, it does raise the possibility that if you overdo it, if you take a mega dose of all of these molecules, you might overstimulate. So finding that balance is, is the challenge over the next few years. Yeah, 